Um, it is so, so great to see all of you. My name is Kia Leek, and I am the Programs and Development Coordinator at WIA. Um, <laughs> and it's so good to be here with you. Uh, for those of you who are new to our community, uh, welcome. A little background on us. Women's Earth Alliance is a 16-year global initiative uh, that trains, resources, and catalyzes grassroots women leaders uh, to protect our environment and build healthy, safe, and just communities now and into the future. Since 2006, WIA has worked at the intersection of women's rights and the environment, creating programs that serve grassroots leaders around key environmental themes of climate change, water, agriculture, land protection, and more. Uh, in partnership with both national and global organizations and networks, we uh, co-designs capacity building trainings where women leaders access technology and financing, mentorship and global alliance. And today you will meet uh, a couple of the women who are a part of that network. And uh, before we get started, um, I'd love to share a quick video uh, and share a peek into WIA's mission and history. Grandmother. Tell me about when you were a little girl. Well, my dear, long ago in the early part of the 21st century, many had forgotten that human life and the earth upon which it depends are precious. The careless ways of humankind polluted the air, the water, the food, the land, and our bodies and minds. In these times, women bore the greatest burdens. With dignity, we took on the essential acts of tending the land and collecting water, though our lives and livelihoods were constantly threatened. And while the wisdom that was needed to heal the earth had been in our bones for ages, even that precious knowledge was ignored by those who claimed to know what was best for us. Moved by this wisdom, 30 women from around the world came together. Each woman understood the problem of having too little or the problem of having too much, and they began to weave a new story. A story of women leaders transforming their own communities, sharing resources and restoring balance upon the earth. A story rooted in the undeniable fact that when women thrive, communities thrive. In this story, our wisdom was respected, and those who wished to help began to listen. We recognized our interdependence, exchanging solutions like gifts. Around the globe, women joined hands and the story took root. They hosted trainings, learned sustainable technologies, and taught others. People across regions stepped forward in support. Speaking out, their message was heard. They shared knowledge and linked strategies. Real change blossomed as communities took action to advocate, innovate, and preserve. We began to remember the preciousness of the simple things like water, land, and seeds. We remembered to work together. We remembered our real power. After this long journey, we now stand safely on the land in balance, men and women together, caring for each other with visionary solutions, preserving the earth for those who will follow. We have finally come home. I feel like such a short video, but <laughs> I feel like it perfectly depicts uh, the mission and uh, where we uh, began. So thank you for watching that with us. Uh, while we are gathering virtually today, we want to acknowledge that Women's Earth Alliance is based in what is currently known as Berkeley, California, but what is also known as Hushin, the ancestral unceded land of the Cochinia speaking Ohlone people. And I wanna thank all of our Ohlone relatives for allowing us to call this place home. We reside on stolen land. And as we 
we as an organization, as community members, have a responsibility to do all that we can to be good guests of this land and its original stewards. So thank you for being a part of this shared vision of our alliance in which our future is not only thriving and sustainable, but just. And as we uh, move on to our speaker portion, I'm so excited to uh, introduce our first speaker, Brady Seals. Uh, she is an alumni of our US Accelerator program. Uh, it's a four month program that invites environmental grassroots women leaders who are seeking to deepen their work and connect with other like-minded leaders. And um, I've had the pleasure of uh, getting to know Brady throughout the program. Uh, she is a manager in RMI's Carbon Free Building Program in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, she leads the program's work on air quality and public health, energy access. Um, and she actually began uh, her career um, at a nonprofit promoting biofuels-based cookstoves, which we'll also be talking about clean cookstoves in this time. Um, and she's just made it a part of her mission to make energy, um, access to energy more affordable and accessible for everyone. And uh, I just know you're gonna learn so much from her. So uh, with that, I will pass it on to Brady. Thank you, Kia. It's so nice to be here. I'll just make sure I can get my slides set up. Um, fantastic. Well, uh, as Kia said, I'm Brady Fields. I um, live in Boulder, Colorado, the ancestral lands of the Arapaho, Ute, and Cheyenne. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Boulder. And in fact, as I was waiting for the presentation to start, I saw my very first hummingbird of the season arriving back. Uh, so I'll take that as a very good sign to be here with you today. Um, and before I start, I just want to give a huge thank you to the Women's Earth Alliance for inviting me and for having me in last year's uh, Women's Accelerator. And it was funny because it's called an accelerator, but all the 33 women, I think, would agree with me. And we talked about this often that it really was a time for us to slow down and become grounded and connected with others. Um, I met so many inspiring women. I've already nominated for the next cohort um, and it was just a, a wonderful experience. So if you know any women climate leaders, uh, a plug to nominate or apply, it's such a fantastic opportunity. So a little bit about myself and uh, RMI, formerly known as Rocky Mountain Institute. So we just turned 40 years old. So we are a 40 year old nonprofit organization. Um, we're based in a few different places. You can see on the screen, Colorado, New York, Oakland, California, Washington, DC. Um, and our whole mission is to transform our energy system. Uh, we, you know, we used to talk about low carbon. Now we want to see if we can get to zero carbon. Um, we want this to be an energy transition for all. And so basically anything that touches climate and energy, we have a program for it. So I sit on our carbon free buildings program where we'll talk a lot about today. But before I start, I just wanted to say a little bit more about myself and my story. And Kia mentioned it before. Um, I just am honored to be here with Olenike, who's someone who I had heard about um, in my past work before RMI, where I worked for about 11 years internationally on clean cook stoves and, and household energy. So I, I know you'll learn more from her, but um, I would be traveling to places where, you know, four billion people still cooking with traditional fuels. Um, and it was really hard to try and find solutions and solutions that were from within the communities that could um, really scale. So I think what Olenike has done in Nigeria is just a great example of a success story. Um, and I would come home from these trips and I would cook for myself using a gas stove. Uh, and at the time, I believed that gas stoves were the, the cleanest option. It was in many senses what we were promoting. I, we, the Royal We, um, as the international development community on clean cook stoves. And when I started working at RMI, 
we were approaching this issue from a climate perspective, but the more we talk to public health leaders, I think I saw Walter uh, on this call and, and others, we heard that there is a huge health issue um, for getting gas out of buildings. And so we dug into this issue with partners, Mothers Out Front, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Sierra Club, um, to do research on this topic. And what we found is the basis for this presentation, but also a lot of our work. And uh, so today, just real quickly, I have about 20 minutes with you. Um, we'll do a very quick poll. Uh, just to get a sense of where we are. Um, and then it's really simple. I'm going to try to make the case uh, in three ways for why we should electrify buildings, for climate, for health, for equity. Um, and then we'll go into some of the challenges and solutions at different levels. But first, uh, something fun. And let's see if this works. So first, I'm very curious to know what kind of stove do you have? very possible that you have more than one. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can actually, let's see. We had a little trouble with this earlier. Um, okay, so I think this is the result, but I'm not sure if this will work here, but the first one, if you can see, is sort of what kind of stove do you have? And the first is natural gas. The second is LPG or propane. Um, the third, is induction, which uses electricity. Uh, the fourth is an electric stove, and you can see the photos here, either a smooth top, which is glass or ceramic, or an electric coil stove, um, or wood or charcoal. So unfortunately, I don't know if the poll is working, um, but maybe if we just drop it into the chat, what you cook with. Um, and again, it may be more than one, but we'd love to hear from a few folks on what you're cooking with. Let's see. Okay, we see, see some gas coming in, induction, electric coil, gas, electric, natural gas, fire emoji, electric smooth top. This is great. Okay, electric coils. All right, wow. So really around the board, I'm seeing a lot of natural gas, a lot of electric smooth tops, some induction, LPG, portable induction, but the house is natural gas, okay. Great, and so really what I'm hoping to say is what we cook with is really a product of where we live um, around the world, but even in the US. So that's fantastic. So I have one more poll, and we'll come back to some of these answers. So second poll, uh, does your stove have ventilation? So no, um, yes, it vents outdoors. You can see the photo, there. It's, it's ducted or there's a, a pipe that flows and removes the cooking pollutants outdoors. Or you may have one like I do in my own home where it recirculates. So you can see this next photo. There is a, a rain hood, but it doesn't actually exhaust to the outside. Um, and then it could be that you're not sure. So let's see. Recirculating indoors, we have some, we have some fans, some folks don't have it. Okay, there's a hood to the outside. So again, it's very, it's very um, different. And I just learned a fact from a new report published earlier this week from the National Center for Healthy Housing, where they said, 90% of renters don't have any ventilation. 90% of renters in the US don't have any form of ventilation. Um, okay, great. This is so helpful. Thank you for this. We'll be coming back to these. Uh, and sorry to pull that work, but you are quick on the chat and that was that was great. Perfect. So let's let's go into it and then these responses will really inform some of our discussion. So Firstly, uh, why electrify buildings? And so let's start with climate. That's what RMI uh, is bread and butter, what we are known for. So buildings are a surprisingly overlooked source of climate pollution. Uh, burning fossil fuels in buildings in the US is responsible for 10% of US greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll mention, because I know we have some international folks on the call, Buildings are responsible for 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. When you take into account the direct emissions from burning fuels and the carbon that it takes, the steel and cement and everything else to make buildings. So buildings are a huge source of climate pollution, but they're overlooked. 
And in the U.S., that 10 percent, what that means is 70 million homes and businesses are burning fossil fuels. So here in the U.S., we see that the primary energy demand is for space heating. The second is for water heating and the third is for cooking. In other places, and Ola Nike may talk more about this, but this could be reversed where the primary energy demand, and I worked a lot in Ethiopia and Madagascar, um, Mozambique, South Africa, cooking was often the primary energy demand. So these are the three appliances you can think of in your home, your furnace, uh, your hot water heater and your stove that maybe is burning with fossil fuel and contributing to some of that climate pollution. Um, and we have a bit of good news and a bit of bad news. So this chart is saying a lot, but the main thing it's saying is that we have done a really good job of um, making our power sector, how we generate electricity cleaner. So in fact, uh, the, elect the emissions from electric power is down 40% since 2007. So in 13 years, we've been able to cut carbon pollution from the generating power by 40%. But along the way, we've forgotten about buildings. And so some of our premise, and I share this because often people say, you know, why should we electrify buildings if my power is still coming from coal or from gas? And I think the reason for us, we feel, is if we don't address buildings now, we could be getting locked into uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. And some of us may live in houses that are 100 years old. My house is 40 years old. Um, so we really feel that now is the time to address buildings. And this was shocking to me when I saw this study. This is from a study by um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT experts. Um, it was published in the journal Nature. Basically, this is saying that air, air pollution and the health impacts from exposure to this air pollution is getting better in every sector except buildings. So in blue, you can see our road uh, emissions and air, air pollution and then health consequences is decreasing, power generation is decreasing, industry is decreasing, but when we look at commercial and residential, we are going in the wrong direction. Um, and this is actually from burning all fuels in buildings here in the U.S. So it's gas, oil, it's also wood and biomass. So we are looking at that trajectory and saying, what are we going to do about it? But the really compelling piece and, and the piece that I would say more so keeps me up at night is this health implication. So our indoor air quality is often worse than our outdoor air quality. Um, even before the pandemic, we were spending about 90% of our home, of our time indoors. And the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency here in the US, say that inside our indoor air may be two to five and as high as a hundred times higher indoors than outdoors. Um, and homes with a gas stove have 50 to 400% higher nitrogen dioxide emissions than homes with electric stoves. Now nitrogen dioxide is a pollutant we'll be talking about. It's a gas, it's invisible, it's odorless, um, and it is basically produced when you're burning a fossil fuel. So nitrogen dioxide has a number of health impacts uh, from direct exposure, but outdoors, it also turns into ozone in particular matter. So I like to think of nitrogen dioxide as, as a bit of a triple threat, but one that we can also address at the root cause. So just as we were seeing earlier uh, with our poll, um, in the U.S., one out of every three homes cooks with gas. So it's about 35% of U.S. households cook with natural gas. Uh, and that depends a lot where you live. So in the southeast where it's electrified, you'll see a lot more electric stoves. If you live in New York, California, Illinois, as many as 70% of households cook with gas. And so this is in general a nature of, of where you live, where there are gas lines. And there are over 3 million miles of gas lines in this country. So it's likely uh, if you're cooking with natural gas that, you know, when you look at your stove, essentially that's one end of a natural gas pipeline. Um, 
I know I have a lot of statistics, but if, if you remember one thing from this presentation, uh, I think that this is, is really the key statistic. Um, children who live in homes with gas stove have a 42% increased risk of experiencing asthma symptoms and a 24% increased risk of being diagnosed with asthma by a doctor. So these numbers are similar to the numbers that we see from exposure to secondhand smoke in a house. Um, why haven't we heard about gas stoves more? You know, why is this? And children are more susceptible to adults to illnesses from air pollution. And a couple of reasons. Um, children have higher physical activity and breathing rates. Anyone who's home with children during the pandemic knows this. Uh, they have a higher lung surface to body ratio and smaller bodies. And their little lungs and immune systems are still growing. Um, so we've seen this, and this is, uh, we looked at 50 years of health data and found that this health evidence for asthma risk in children has been generally the same. I've talked to several doctors and experts who have done studies on this and say, you know, they see a direct correlation of when the gas stove is used and children having to use their inhaler more at night. So we aren't, as RMI, doing anything new. We are collecting a lot of this information and trying to put it out there. But this statistic just, just always gets me every time, this 42% increased risk of having asthma and the 24% increased risk of being diagnosed with asthma by a doctor. Um, what what is a safe level? This is a question that comes up a lot. And unfortunately, we don't have any standards or really any guidelines uh, for some of the pollutants like nitrogen dioxide. So we're often left benchmarking these to outdoor air quality standards. So you can see the, the US EPA says um, outside, you know, you should only be exposed for one hour to, to 100 parts per billion. Well, we can see from the studies that baking a cake in the oven, which maybe the oven's on for 45 minutes or an hour, is, uh, has peak, so it re reaches up to 230 parts per billion. This is just to show that some of the levels we see indoors from cooking uh, can often exceed outdoor levels where essentially it would be illegal if these same emission levels were seen outdoors. So some of the health effects of nitrogen dioxide in children, again, children is where we have the, the most evidence, um, a lot about increased uh, irritated airways. So nitrogen dioxide is a lung irritant, increases the risk of childhood asthma, cardiovascular effects. Um, and very importantly, in 2016, the US Environmental Protection Agency said there is a causal relationship between short-term exposure to nitrogen dioxide and respiratory effects like asthma attacks. And there's a likely causal, um, a causal relationship between developing asthma. So the bottom line is that we're learning more about nitrogen dioxide and uh, we know that even short-term exposures at relatively low levels can have health impacts. Um, I think Olenike will probably talk about particulate matter, PM 2.5, where we see from wood and charcoal, and, and that, of course, is a huge health concern. I had worked in clean cook stoves for 11 years, had never really thought about or heard about nitrogen dioxide, and I think this is where we see with PM 2.5, pneumonia in children, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in women, and with NO2, we're seeing asthma and some of those. And of course, we know that asthma in the US is the number one chronic disease. So one of my fears thinking internationally is that if we transition from wood charcoal to a fossil fuel like gas, we may be shifting diseases from that pneumonia, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and start seeing more of asthma. In fact, there was one study in Uganda that did show when people went from wood and charcoal to LPG, in some cases, asthma uh, risk uh, went up. And, and the researchers hypothesized that could be because the stove is now going from either a separate cooking area or outside, now inside the house with perhaps less ventilation. Um, the third piece I want to touch on is equity. 
Uh, we know that their air pollution in general is a health equity um, issue and a climate justice issue. Uh, and so when it comes to gas stoves and the nitrogen dioxide, we know that lower income households and communities of color for that matter may be at higher risk of exposure to gas stove pollution. A few factors and perhaps the biggest one is smaller unit size. Um, there have been study after study that say the smaller the room or the space, uh, the higher the concentration, the less opportunity this gas has to spread and dissipate. Uh, we also know that more people per home can increase this exposure concentration. Um, older homes, inadequate, inadequate ventilation, all of this plays a role. And the really key one is using the stove or oven for supplemental heat. Um, in a cold you, know, you can imagine a Baltimore or New York City apartment and the heating bills may be high and opening up the stove or oven and leaving it on to help provide the supplemental heat. From census data, we know that even in states like California, this, this has happened. So it's not only the cold states and um, a non-insignificant number of households rely on the gas stove or oven for supplemental heat, which can lead to a high buildup of these emissions. Finally, we know that unfortunately, we don't all breathe the same air um, and higher exposure to outdoor air pollution, which increases the risk for other kinds of diseases and exposures can you know, have a higher risk. And then having a greater asthma burden. Asthma is a profoundly um, inequitable disease among children and adults. And one of the populations that's most at risk to this pollution from gas stoves is people who are already living with asthma. So one of the things that's challenging, uh, I would say about this work is how do we promote interventions that prioritize overburden and underserved communities and communities of color. We know there are these disparities in health outcomes. Again, so much of this depends on where you live. If you are living near um, you know, a toxic waste site or, um, or an, a trash incinerator or something, you may have higher outdoor exposure. And then if you have a lot of fossil fuel appliances and perhaps a small household, you may have a higher indoor exposure level. We also know that there's um, you know, this heat or eat dilemma. And this is one of the things that I think is so challenging on when you have to make these decisions on, you know, can you eat or do you have to pay your heating bills? And this is an issue with electrification. How can we promote beneficial electrification that's truly holistic, looks at this and ensures that, for example, utility bills aren't going to be increasing for those communities who are already um, struggling and who very often pay the highest bills in many cases. So we know that these interventions really have to prioritize these communities to receive the benefits first. So let's talk a little bit about challenges and solutions. Hopefully I've um, made the case that there's, there's a health and equity and climate reason to electrify buildings. So let's talk a little bit about what that means at the individual policymaker and then the, the movement level. So for individuals, um, gas stoves, we have some, there are things you can do. And the easiest that you can do is if you have that range hood, which some of, some of you do, some of you have the recirculating like me, uh, you can run it when you're cooking. Some of the studies show that less than 25% of people use their range hoods. Um, I would put myself in that category before I was doing this work. And actually most, every study has showed that cooking on the back burner is more effective. So it may take a little bit of a switch in habit. And you can see from this, this photo um, that the range hood does not extend all the way over the stove. And, and that's the main reason why cooking on the back burners is more effective. You have better chance for the pollutants to go up. Uh, you can open a window while cooking. Um, and then another piece that we didn't talk about is carbon monoxide. Um, our, the standard carbon monoxide detector 
is shockingly not rated to go off at levels at which health impacts can be felt. Um, so if you have an underlying cardiovascular disease or you're maybe more sensitive, you can actually get a low level carbon monoxide detector that will alert you um, since carbon monoxide is one of the main pollutants that comes from gas stoves. You can also uh, get a small plug-in induction stove. I think somebody in the chat say, that said they have a plug-in induction stove. This is what we use at my house for our grill. We have a cast iron and we go to our porch and plug it in um, and cast iron. So we call it modern day grilling. It's very versatile. Um, and ultimately you can switch to an electric or an induction uh, cook cooktop. Um, shifting some cooking to things like electric kettles, toaster ovens can also, uh, if you have a gas stove, you can reduce some of your exposure. Um, the other piece that we didn't talk about too much, but it mostly has to do with outdoor air quality and climate pollution is that big chunk of our energy demand, which is heating and cooling. Uh, so we are big fans of the electric heat pump. And the heat pump essentially works the same way that your refrigerator works. Uh, so it uses a refrigerant and it basically is a air conditioner and a heater in one. So you have um, one device that can heat or cool your home. It's two to three times more efficient than gas. Uh, and you can also find it for your hot water heater. Now, one piece I didn't mention, but I should have, uh, is a few months ago, researchers at Stanford University found that gas stoves actually leak methane while they're off. And so methane isn't necessarily a he direct health concern. Uh, it does become a health concern outdoors where it contributes to ozone and other health harming, but it's more of a climate issue. So about 1% of all of the gas that was delivered to get to the stoves was leaked as unburned methane. So 1% from everyone's stove doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but 35% of US households have gas stoves. So that is actually 43 million gas stoves leaking an average of 1% methane. And so that adds up to the climate impact of about half a million cars. Um, Finally, we, you know, we don't want to put this all on the individual at RMI, and many of the folks in our coalition are aiming this at policymakers. Policymakers should be the ones protecting us from our appliances. Um, those should come with warning labels. Our building codes should be health protective. Um, we should have guidelines for indoor air quality. We should have incentives. So to get an induction stove or an electric stove, it should be um, our policymakers proposing that and public buildings and funds. Uh, we're doing a project in New York with the New York Public Housing Agency at replacing gas stoves with induction. And not one of these apartments had ventilation or things like that. Um, and also if you're a renter, this is such a challenging issue. Property owners should have some requirement to protect their uh, renters from some of these health impacts. So the last piece I wanna to touch on is just this movement. So building electrification, I think was a grassroots movement, is a grassroots movement. It started in Berkeley, California. I saw someone, a couple of people here from Berkeley. So congratulations on being the first seed, uh, July, 2019. There are two policy levers you can pull for electrifying buildings. One is to require that all new construction has to be electric to meet climate goals. Um, and two, to have policies in place to start doing these retrofits. And especially with keeping in mind the equity um, element and, and prioritizing public and affordable housing. Um, so this started in Berkeley in less than three years, it grew to 54 cities and communities in California committed to phasing out gas and a few states. And this started by people coming together and wanting to do something about buildings and talking to their very local um, council members and passing these building ordinances. And it's just, it's crazy to me when you see California, especially 54 cities in less than three years is truly amazing. This is just an example of a broad coalition in California 
that was calling on the California Energy Commission to pass an all electric state building code. Uh, we didn't quite get it. We still don't have a full state wide. Uh, so this, this impact is happening on the local level. It's happening on the community level, but you can start to see the environmental justice community, the health community, the environmental community um, coming together for this. Um, and just a couple more slides. So the building electrification is, is what's called an existential threat by the gas industry. You can see some of these headlines, the battle, attack, waging war. Um, so the gas industry really sees building electrification as a threat and the gas stove as a main threat because that's the one appliance that we're interacting with as consumers uh, mostly. So Rebecca Lieber, who's a journalist, she's at Vox now, but was at Mother Jones. If you're interested in this, she wrote um, some really great articles about what kind of tactics the gas industry has been using, anything from paying influencers, uh, you know, this is a marketing campaign going back to the 30s and 40s to try to convince Americans um, to love gas. So there's some great reporting here. Uh, but one I just wanted to mention that I think is uh, where we're starting to see the challenges for the movement is something called a preemption bill or a ban on bans. Everything that you see in pink has a legislation that's passed at the state level that prevents local cities, municipalities, communities from organizing and passing like a, a building code in a, in a small community or small city. It's some of the same tactics that we've seen um, about trying to ban a ban on plastic bags and tobacco products. And so this is something, you know, to be worrying because we are on this grass movement. Um, the blue is the states where we have all electric policies, but unfortunately there's a lot more pink than blue on this map right now. Um, so just to highlight that this is one challenge that we're facing as we move forward. Um, this is my last uh, slide and, and a call to action in some senses, which is that every minute a new customer is added to the US gas system. So how do we slow this clock? Um, I think we can only do it together as communities. I think that's where we've seen success. Uh, and then around the world with buildings, we have to think about how we build the places we live, work, go to school. Um, the equivalent of one New York City is built every month in the global south. So thank you so much. I would, can talk for a long time about this, but I look forward to your questions and hearing from Ola Nike. Thank you again for having me here. Thank you so much, Brady, for that really amazing and informative session. Um, now I'm really excited to introduce everyone here to Ola Nike. Ola Nike has been a partner of WIA of for many, many years, and we did our Clean Cook Stoves project in Nigeria in partnership with her. She is also the founder of WISE, which is a nonprofit organization in Nigeria working on uh, these issues of clean cook stoves as well as uh, women's leadership in the climate movement. Olanike is present on this call and will be available to answer any questions you have during our Q&A session, but for the, her presentation, she very kindly pre-recorded a video of her speaking about the issue and uh, bringing in the local context of Nigeria. So we're just going to play that video for you now. Hey everyone, my name is Olani K. Olubuji Daramola, and I'm the founder and program director of Women Initiative for Sustainable Environment. We are a grassroots nonprofit organization that advances the rights, roles, and responsibilities of women in natural resource governance and peace building. We promote constructive environmental ideals and practices by empowering people, especially women and young females, to become stewards of our natural resources and, like I said, peace builders. I'm so excited to be a part of this Power Up event, which is focused on women-led 
clean energy solutions to power up our world. I'm so excited because um, we have various interventions that looks at putting women at the front lines of addressing clean energy challenges, especially as it relates to access to clean cooking energy. I'm excited to also speak about our program with um, Women's Earth Alliance, which we launched in 2015, our Wise Women Clean Cook Stove Entrepreneurship and Training Program. To date, that intervention has raised over 800 clean cook stove entrepreneurs and advocates across Nigeria. Let me just share a bit background about how this project started. In 2013, I came across a World Health Organization report that stated that Nigeria tops the list of countries where women were dying annually from smoke-related illnesses. And then the same report identified that any woman who cooks breakfast, lunch, and supper over an open fire, it's estimated that she has smoked between three to 24 packets of cigarettes on that day. I was so alarmed by the statistics and so as a result of my concern, I decided to do a research across communities in my part of the world, which is Kaduna State, Nigeria. I went across neighborhoods, um, medium class, high density, and I was surprised at what I saw. I actually thought it was just the poor that relied on traditional methods of cooking their food. But alas, I found women within the city who still rely on the traditional method of cooking their food over open fire. I remember one of the ladies I met in a, in a very small um, sized kitchen just about 1.2 meter by 1.2 meter and the whole walls of that kitchen was black i'll link that up to another fact that i came across that women who depend on open methods of cooking that the, their stomach walls, their intestines, is actually just as black as what we see reflected. And when I um, asked this young woman if the smoke was not affecting her, she said, it's actually killing my eyes. And tears were actually dropping from her eyes. Her eyes were red. This is just one out of so many women I met during this um, investigative research. And I became so concerned, wondering what could be the support that I could give or WISE as an organization could give to such women. And so um, I found the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Store, which is now the Clean Cooking Alliance, and through that global um, platform, I got introduced to the Nigerian Alliance for Clean Cook Stove, which is also transiting to the Nigerian Clean Cooking Alliance. So this um, clean cook stoves, or you call them improved cook stoves, are actually um, built in a manner that it takes care of um, smoke. You know, they are actually called smokeless stoves. Um, they are called energy efficient stoves. And so when I found this product, I started thinking, what could I do? I wrote about it in my online journal on World Pulse, and someone um, who is a part of the community actually reached out to me and said, how could she help? So I told her about the 
Queen Cook's store technology had come across, and so she sent me five hundred um, dollars to say, um, you know, I could just invest it in whatever intervention I was launching. So with that amount, I was able to buy um, fifty cook stoves. It could buy fifty cook stoves, so I bought um, fifty cook stoves, and each then costs about. $10. So I bought 50 and I went back to um, the women that I met during my research and I gave each of them a clean cook stove. And we started identifying other women who needed the stoves. We used different strategies to distribute the stoves and then I updated my benefactor of what we had done with the money she sent. She was so impressed and she doubled the money and sent us $1,000. So we were able to scale up and um, we bought 100 stoves. In 2015, where that Women's Earth Alliance reached out to me to say, oh, Olanike, we want to come to Nigeria to partner with you to launch um, a water sanitation and hygiene project. And I said, oh no. This is not what we're working at right now. I know the issue of water sanitation and hygiene is very important, but one long overlooked issue is the issue of access to clean cooking energy for women. And I told them about what we had done so far and um, the impact we've been able to make and how there is still so much gap in terms of households that needed you know, to, to be given um, or um, to be introduced to this um, clean cook stoves. And so we got interested, the WEAR team got interested, and we started thinking of how to launch an intervention together. And so in 2015, we launched uh, the WEAR Wise Women's Clean Cook Stove Training and Entrepreneurship Project. And we were able to identify 30 women from across communities that Y serves. And so we brought these women together for um, two weeks of training in 2017. And um, we were able to equip these women with information, knowledge, and skills um, that centered on enterprise development, business planning, um, leadership and um, agency and um, we also gave these women a seed grant that helps them launch their intervention. The, the, the second part of the training in April, quite a number of these women haven't gone back to their community to introduce the clean cook stove technology to them, had started selling stoves and one woman that stood out was Binta Yahaya. She had sold 70 stoves before coming back for the second week of training. And that was so encouraging and exciting for us because these women were also making money, you know, from um, introducing these stoves to their communities. And so after the second week of training, these women were each, they worked in um, teams of two. Uh, so we had 15 teams. These women were given about 40 stoves each and at the end of the project we had given them a target of one to, uh, um, target to sell a thousand eight hundred stoves but by the end of six months they had surpassed the goal that we gave them and so we knew we were up to something one other interesting thing is that binta has become a major clean cook stove manufacturer in nigeria like I said um, earlier, we have, as of today, raised over 800 clean cook stove entrepreneurs and advocates across Nigeria. So the health impact is tremendous. We have um, seen drastic reduction in the health challenges that women um, face in terms of um, how they used to be affected by the smoke from their fireplaces. So as of today, a lot of communities that have continued to adopt the clean cook stove technology can now breathe cleaner air. 
and then um, you know of course by improving the air quality in households um, the, the, the the health of the women the health of their family members um, is preserved and also same for across communities we've also launched this intervention in um, an internally displaced persons camp where we also distributed clean cook stoves to women um, who whose husbands had been killed um, during the time of um, insurgency so we're so excited to continue to equip women to be at the front lines of you know, contributing to global climate action, you know, through um, the promotion of uh, clean energy products like the clean cook stoves, the um, solar um, lamps, and um, what have you. So I would like to use this opportunity to invite other women, other um, people who really want to take climate action to you know, continue to support WEAR and um, continue to support other grassroots organizations like ours who are working day and night to see that um, women um, are able to drive um, climate solutions. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for that wonderful video, Lanike. Um, I guess now we're we're running a little behind, um, but we do have some questions that came up for Brady and Olenike, and we'll try and get through as many as possible uh, before we let you all go <laughs> and get back to your day. Um, Brady, Cora had asked about the rates of methane and other GHG, GHG emissions as well as carbon, and um, I guess maybe Cora, if I'm not articulating this well enough, like when you were talking about tracking GHG emissions and um, the carbon being like such a thing that is uh, released into the atmosphere, are you also including methane and other ones in those, um, I guess, uh, percentages? Perfect. It's a great question. Um, I would say not enough is being done right now. So when we get these, these numbers from the Energy International Energy Association, they often don't include methane. Um, we have worked with these Stanford professors who are looking at appliances, finding about 1% leak, methane leaking from water heaters and stoves. They're measuring furnaces now. And we are actively petitioning the EPA to start including methane in their reporting. So one that is a huge issue and one that is completely underreported. Um, for example, right now the EPA says that 24 gigatons of methane come from all household appliances, and the Stanford researchers estimate that 28 gigatons come from stoves alone. So it, it's, a huge, uh, it's a huge gap, and hopefully one that we'll see addressed in the data hopefully soon. Can I follow up on that quickly? One per, that 1% 1 figure, it's 1% 1 of what? 1% of the natural gas in the heaters is leaking, or...? Yes, 1% of the gas that's delivered through the pipeline to the stove is leaking as unburned. Got it. Okay. And the methane is connected to the extraction process primarily of natural gas? Or is there another factor? Yes, good question. Methane just wants to leak. And so I think like we'll see leaks we'll see leaks at the where it's drilling, we'll see leaks throughout the pipeline, and we'll see leaks behind the meter, which is kind of at the household level. So I think what we're missing is the accounting for this full life cycle of 3 million gas pipelines, the source, you know, where they're going and all the leaks along the way that are really under undercounted right now. Oh, wow. The 1% is just from the household. Okay. Thank you. That's horrible. Thank you. Thanks for that great question, Cora. Uh, Ola Nike, Beverly had a question about what is considered a clean cook stove in Nigeria. And if you could, you know, briefly tell us a little more about what is the actual technology that you're using in the clean cook stoves. Um, let's 
Hi, Terry. Hi, Aline. Okay. Would you Hello, like Terry. to respond or repeat the question? Yeah, please. Yeah, so Beverly was asking if you could elaborate a bit more on the clean cook stove technology that uh, is primarily being used in Nigeria and what, how does it make it cleaner than a regular um, fire cook stove? Um. Unfortunately, Olenike might be having some Wi-Fi connect connectivity issues. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but we do have all the questions that have come in through the chat and we tripod stand, um, using tripod or, or tree stone where um, firewoods um, is arranged and um, you know there's no limit to the quantity of firewoods. Uh, women just put so much and um, there's a lot of wastage because the heat more often than not does not get to the pots and so the women have to use so much firewood that's um, wasting so much um, energy from uh, biomass and uh, with the improved cook stove technology is designed in a manner that it has insulation provided either by um, clay liners or fiberglass. And so the fiberglass or the clay liners introduced into this um, cook stoves has a way of trapping heat. And so um, the pot gets more heat than um, it would ordinarily from the traditional method of cooking. And in Africa, you know, energy poverty is a reality and it's a big issue. And when you look at household um, um, air pollution, it's also, you know, something that is um, of great concern. And so this, um, and looking at um, how people can move up the energy ladder, uh, you're looking at people who are already so poor that they cannot, um, you know, afford um, maybe the LPG as an alternative. Some are even scared to use LPG because there are a lot of cases of um, gas explosions. And so some people would not even want to go there. So um, the improved cook stoves are just a ready alternative, you know, that can move these people from, um, you know, the very expensive, toxic uh, methods of open fire cooking to something that is, um, you know, not just the last bus stop for them, but just the next level of uh, moving them up the energy ladder to say, okay, this is a better option that can protect your health and also uh, protect our environment and also save costs too. Definitely. Thank you for that great answer, Alanike. I know we're a little uh, behind on time, so we do have everyone's questions in the chat and we'll try and send out as many resources and responses to those questions in our follow-up email. I'll hand it over now to Kia to close us out. Wow, I feel like I always get hit um, with both of you, whether it be all of your statistics Brady, looking at that map and what you and RMI are up against and Alani K, like um, just all the experiences that you've had with these women who have had these health problems, just putting, trying to put food on the table for themselves and for their family. Um, you guys are just both doing such amazing work and constantly um, inspiring uh, to, to this group. And I'm so thankful to have you both a part of this community. Um, yes, so next steps, um, we are going to send out a follow-up email, um, and it will include, um, the calls, calls to action that both Brady and Alana Kay have kind of touched on. Um, we will include the information, um, that was presented in the slides. They'll be in the recording as well as Alani Kay's recorded video. 
Um, and like Tarita said, we will do our best to address all questions um, that we have listed on the side, um, as well as um, how to stay connected uh, with both of them. Um, oh yeah, and we'll also include social media um, and emails and et cetera, um, if you have more personal uh, questions that you'd like to post to them and outreach to them, because we want to continue these conversations because um, as that map showed us and as both Alani K and Brady have showed us that we have so much work um, left to be done in the area of energy um, and making it accessible to all um, and just making the space a more just um, equitable, equitable space. So thank you so much uh, for giving us our time, giving us a little extra time. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in the future. So please look out uh, for events, um, in the future, we, we're lining up a few more, um, so, uh, and we'll be, we'll be really excited to see you again. <laughs>